Good morning. Welcome to the Sunday TE breakfast session, which is being conducted under the AGCs of Forum of Cardiac Anesthesiologists, Bangalore, which is also the Bangalore chapter of IACTA. And uh, we have Dr. Parimala Prasanna Simha, leading cardiac anesthesiologist from Jayadeva, to moderate the session. I'll be dealing with the subject of paravalvular leak following valve replacement, especially mitral and iotic, in a very bird's eye view pattern. And I request Dr. Parimala to introduce this subject. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, sir. It's my pleasure to invite Dr. Murlida, sir, to uh, educate everyone about the importance of paravalvular leak detection, uh, especially post bypass so that we can avoid the uh, future uh, complications and deterioration in a particular uh, case and it is a difficult topic uh, difficult to uh, diagnose and convince the surgeons about uh, the smaller leaks uh, which may give rise to problem in the future so will uh, help us to understand this topic uh, i invite you to start the topic sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parimala, for joining us. And uh, can you see my slide? Yes, sir. Rajiv is looking good. Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I would like to thank the FCA for wow. this opportunity to conduct these meetings and also Dr. Parimala for joining us. And I noticed that Dr. Sanjeevani and other uh, important people are there in the meeting and I request them to give their comments at the end. To begin with, um, valvular heart disease remains prevalent all over the world. Despite advancements in wall repair techniques, valve replacement is still common in adult patients. Although physical examination can alert the clinical uh, clinician for the presence of prosthetic valve dysfunction, imaging techniques with the knowledge of the hemodynamic assessment is needed to evaluate the prosthetic valve function. Intraoperatively, echocardiography with Doppler is the currently method of choice used for uh, assessment of prosthetic valves. I'll be dealing with this uh, subject in the following headings in a very succinct manner. What is the burden of the problem? What are the prosthetic valves which are available? What are the signature jets of each particular valve? Why we should worry about the paravalvular leaks? And how do you evaluate prosthetic valves, especially in terms of uh, regurgitation? Why this is very challenging? Dr. Parimala said it is difficult to ask. That is true. I will mention how why it is so difficult to evaluate prosthetic valves in terms of their function, especially regurgitation. How do you orient the mitral and aortic valves with the clock phase so that we can easily communicate to the surgeon where exactly is the leak? Because the TEE findings are not exactly the same as the surgeon's orientation. Actually, they are different. The surgeon's orientation is absolutely different from the TEE views, and hence we should be able to communicate to the surgeon where is the leak and tell him exactly at which point in the clock phase is the leak. Assessing the severity of aortic regurgitation following a transcatheter aortic valve replacement. There are two algorithms. We'll quickly go through that and I'll illustrate the two cases uh, which I mean we do several of them, but are two cases I have chosen to illustrate the paraprosthetic leak and how we have dealt with it. Coming to the disease burden. As many as 300,000 patients every year require valve replacement in the world. And this number will be multiplied three times. That is, it will become 900,000 by next 20 years. The ideal valve should mimic the characteristics of the normal valve in terms of hemodynamics, 
durability, resistance to thrombosis, and easy implantability. But ideal valve is not yet available, and there are a lot of uh, uh, research going on to give us the best possible valve in a given patient. And also, we should know that one a valve which is suitable for one patient may not be suitable for another patient. Coming to parallel prosthetic regurgitation, this is demonstrated in about uh, five to twenty percent of all surgical implantations. But this incidence is coming down because of the improvement of the valve design and a better understanding of the valvular dysfunction which can occur. If you take the aortic valve replacement, the incidence about coated incidence is about two to ten percent, and it about five to fifteen percent in mitral position. That means that every two patients out of hundred, uh, sorry, every uh, sorry twenty patients out of hundred or two patients out of ten may have may have paravalvular leak. The incidence is uh, increased with the highly calcified native aortic valve or in the presence of infective endocarditis. Uh, and also, in when you're talking about transcatheter aortic valve replacement, if you're undersizing the valve or the valve is malpositioned, and in a patient with extensive annular calcification, the incidence of paravalvular leak may be high. In patients who have balloon expandable valves in transiotic valve, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, if there's a trans um, periprosthetic leak, if you redilate the valve once more, most often this regurgitation will subside or even disappear. These are the types of valves. Several types are available in the market depending upon the uh, patient's needs. I think we should add here our own Chitra valve. It should be included here. We have the mechanical processes which can be ball and cage, tilting disc, or St. Jude's. I would like to insert Chitra valve here. We can have human tissue valves, stented bioprosthetic valves, sutureless valves, stentless bioprosthetic valves, and these are the transcatheter bioprosthetic valves, which can be balloon expandable or self-expanding. And the new generation of surgical bioprosthetic valves have been uh, devised to better visualization and um, uh, there are additional features which make it more user friendly and with less complications. These are being uh, used nowadays, especially trifecta uh, is coming up in a big way. What are the problems with paravalvular leaks? Why should we worry about it? There are two major issues with paravalvular leaks. One is if it is not addressed, patient will present with heart failure and the symptoms of regurgitation will be present and patient will promptly develop heart failure uh, if it is not addressed. If it is massive, of course, you cannot, there will be difficulty in coming up bypass, but in once you are uh, an, uh, outside the OR and sometimes after discharge, patients do come back with heart failure. And the second major problem is hemolysis. Hemolysis occurs especially if the velocity is high because of the trauma to the blood due because of um, the high velocity jets and patients will have anemia and dark colored urine. To this two major complications, we can also have endocarditis because of paravalvular leak. The presence of paravalvular leak, especially after the transcatheter aortic valve replacement is shown here. If you have mild, moderate or severe. In about three years. The mortality rate is very high in this as compared to those having no paravalvular leak. 
So if you leave one of the paravagnal leak, the mortality within three to five years is going to be high. So these are some of the reasons why we should worry about paravagnal leak. First is heart failure. Second is hemolysis. Third is endocarditis. Fourth is ultimately death. Coming to the signature jets, if you look at these pictures, these are some of the signature jets which are physiological. These are called as physiological jets because these are these are meant to prevent thrombo thrombosis in the valve. And if you look at the St. Jude's valve, there are three to four jets which are travel, traveling towards the center of the left atrium. These are the two leaflets, this is the bileaflet valve, and these jets are traveling towards the center of the left atrium, and there is no, what you call as flow convergence here. Whenever there is a uh, regurgitation, which is of significant nature, there are four things which are happening which we should look for. One is the flow convergence, that is the piece of formation. Then we have the vena contractor. Then we have the jet uh, area. And the fourth phenomenon is the secondary effects of the regurgitation. The secondary effects of regurgitation in the pulmonary vein is the systolic reversal. Whereas in the aortic uh, position, the secondary effects is the Holo diastolic reversal of flow. So these are the four components of regurgitation, which can be noticed if patient have um, significant regurgitation. I'll repeat that. We have the flow convergence with um, piece of formation. Then we have the vena contractor at the level of the effective regurgitation orifice area. Then we have the regurgitation jet itself. And then we can have secondary effects in the form of pulmonary venous systolic flow reversal in case of mitral regurgitation and holodiastolic flow reversal in case of aortic regurgitation. So these are the normal physiological uh, physiological jets which are seen. So in a tilting disc valve, it's a central jet. And what I would like to point out that most of these jets are single color because the, there is not much of turbulence. And they are going toward the center of the left atrium. If there, they, there is a multicolored or velocity is increased, it may be a significant regurgitation. Then coming to ball and cage valve prosthesis, which is shown here, the star Edwards valve, there is a mist form, mist like red, reddish tinge in the center that is indicative of washing jet in this case. Coming to the tissue valves, this is the feature uh, the examples of stented, stentless, and the bio, uh, the uh, what do you call the implantable valves are shown here and these are the pictures echocardiographic pictures shown which is which depict the um, valve function echocardiographically uh, after the implantation and in the last uh, picture we are sh sh demonstrating perivalvular leak in a patient who has undergone percutaneous valve device closure. Then coming to how do you evaluate these valves? Prosthetic valve is a, a, the evaluation is by integration of uh, qualitative, semi-quantitative and quantitative determinants. Some of the parameters are mentioned here. When you evaluate these prosthetic valves, we should know the date date of valve replacement, type and size of the valve, what is the body surface area, what are the symptoms, does the patient have any symptoms, what is the blood pressure and heart rate at the time of measurement of the, at the time of assessment of the valve using echocardiography. And coming to the valve proper, what is the morphological uh, structure of the wall, how is the valve moving, are the leaflets moving or right? Is there any calcification 
or abnormal echo densities on the components of the prosthesis? How is the valve swing ring? Is it uh, fixed well? Is it in, uh, the integrity is good? And coming to the Doppler echocardiography, the counter of the jet velocity, what is the velocity and gradient across the valve, especially with regard to mean pressure gradient? What is the VTI? What is the Doppler velocity index? Pressure half time. What is the effective orifice area? And uh, is there any regurgitation? These are the components of da Doppler echocardiographic evaluation of a prosthetic valve. This is simple to give this list, but what are the challenges? If once the patient has a prosthetic valve, especially metal valve, there is considerable acoustic shadowing of the far field structure, be it TTE or TEE. The far field structures will be shadowed. We cannot make out what is the um, structure beyond the valve because of the shadowing. Sometimes we cannot in interrogate the Doppler with Doppler, uh, the color, I mean the flow patterns. <clears throat> Sometimes the windows may be limited. When you are doing the volumetric estimation, especially when you want to do the stroke volume, etc., to determine the regurgitant fraction, regurgitant volumes, we have to avoid foreshortening. That's a problem. If there are multiple jets, what do you do? And mostly, especially intraoperatively, we depend upon the color Doppler. And we know that color Doppler has several, um, I mean to say, several issues which have to be considered. Color Doppler is uh, uh, impacted by hemodynamics. The hemodynamics has to be optimal for us to get a proper color Doppler signal to be able to quantify the regurgitation. The anesthesia itself will influence the amount of regurgitation as manifested by the regurgitation using color Doppler. And there are technical factors, machine factors, which also determine the color Doppler evaluation. The color Doppler depends upon the jet momentum, pressure gradient, and the velocity. For example, MR jet may appear large if the LV pressure is high, for example, if the patient is having hypertension or aortic stenosis, for a given effective orifice area, MR jet will become larger than when the LV pressure is normal or low. Similarly, AR jet may look small if the aortic diastolic pressure is low. And the other problem with color Doppler is that TTE will be able to identify the anterior structures better. Whereas TEE will identify posterior structures better. This is shown in the TTE here because of the presence of the um, by, um, the prosthetic valve, the structures beyond in the beyond the valve that is in the far field uh, will be obscured when we are doing. Um, the echocardiography, be it TE or TT. This is a TE picture. Innumerable types of valves and special characteristics may be also a daunting task. And any effect of mechanical prosthetic valve position and echocardiographic imaging view on the shadowing and masking of the regurgitation is manifest. And especially if you are looking at the continuity equation, when you want to determine the LVOT diameter after valve replacement, it will be difficult because in the LV long axis view, the LVOT will be shadowed by the replaced mitral valve. So we should have already made LVOT diameter determinations before bypass and use that for calculation of the effective orifice area. to the how do you know using 3d echocardiography where is the jet you have to have we have to have a orientation of the valve at zero degrees 
we are cutting through the A2 and P2 in the mid individual window and 45 degrees we are cutting through P3, A2 and P1. At 90 degrees we are cutting through P3, A3, A2 and A1. And at what 35 degrees, 135 degrees or 140 degrees, we are cutting through P2 and A2 and a bit of biotic value. So if you want to convert this into surgical view, this will be the surgical view. This is the uh, these are the surgeon sees the iota is at the 12 o'clock position, and the leaks here at near the A2 will be 12 o'clock position for the surgeon. And leaks near P2 will be 6 o'clock for the surgeon. And if you are seeing a leak near the early appendage, it will be at between 8 to 10 o'clock position. Similarly, if you are seeing a leak somewhere here, that is A3, P3, it will be 3 o'clock position for the surgeon. That is between 4 and 2 p.m., uh, 2, 2 o'clock. So if you if we have the orientation which is shown in this picture, we may be able to uh, tell the surgeon where exactly is the which clock phase uh, position, which um, position is the leak depending upon the our orientation to the valve. This is our orientation, TE orientation, this is the surgeon's orientation. So the this will be the lateral and this will be medial, this is anterior, this is inferior. So this is what is shown here, the clock phase designation of mitral and aortic valves, valves from the uh, left atrial side is shown. This is the left atrial appendage. This is the 12 o'clock position, 6 o'clock position, 3 and uh, um, about 8 o'clock position here. This is how the surgeon sees and we should be able to communicate and tell him where exactly is the leak depending upon the um, what we find in the mid individual windows, be it uh, uh, four chamber view, commissural view, two chamber view or the long axis view and this is the aortic valve. This is the surgeon's orientation. Again, just notice that our orientation is that this side is the left, this side is the right, this side is the, sorry, this side is the left, this is the right and this is the non-coronary. But for surgeon, it is not the same. The right is here, the left is here, and the non coronary is here. Interatrial septum will be there. So, this is how the clock phase um, orientation, the aortic valve at 12 o'clock position, and uh, interatrial septum on the medial side, left atrial appendage on the lateral side. And this is uh, how we need to interpret. Now coming to quantification. The same parameters which are used to quantify mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation before surgery are applicable. In severe paravalvular leak, there is proximal flow convergence. Aortic regurgitation velocity waveform density is dense. And there is hollow diastolic reversal of the flow in the abdominal aorta in severe cases. These are all severe uh, um, paravalvular leak. Vena contractor with is greater than 0.6. Vena contractor area which can be done using 3D is greater than 0.3 square centimeters. Circumferential extent of PVR more than 30% that I'll show in a different picture. Deceleration time um, is now the what you call as pre, this pressure half time is less than uh, 150 or 200 milliseconds. If you come to resistant volume, it's greater than 60. 
and uh, regurgitant fraction greater than 50% and effective regurgitant orifice area is greater than 0.3. So this is how we look at the diastolic flow reversal in the descending thoracic aorta, pressure half time and the regurgitant fraction and getting effective regurgitant orifice area. And this is a clockwise, so this um, yeah. representation of the aortic valve using TT. This is ref, 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 with reference to TT. And this is the algorithm to, uh, this is uh, developed in patients who undergo transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So if uh, um, this can be, using the algorithm, you can classify the aortic regeneration mild, moderate, or severe. Depending upon the regenerant volume, regenerant fraction, effective or regenerant orifice area. Before that, we need to look at the vena contractor, vena contractor area. What is the circumferential extent of the leak? And is there any flow convergence? What is the pressure half time? And what is the extent of diastolic flow reversal in the iota, whether it is only in the Ascending aorta or is in descending thoracic aorta or is in the abdominal aorta, depending upon, we can grade it as mild, moderate, or severe. Some uh, investigators have come up with index indices which uh, can be used to determine the severity of aortic regurgitation after transcatheter aortic valve replacement. One index is called as aortic regurgitation index, which is the difference between the diastolic arterial blood pressure minus the left ventricle and diastolic pressure divided by systolic blood pressure into 100. This is usually done on the uh, at the end of the valve replacement or in the cat lab or hybrid lab wherever you are doing the TAVR. And if it is less than 25, it has to be addressed straight away because the predicted mortality is very high. There are other indices which have been described in the literature. These are some of the intraoperative, uh, intraprocedural tools for estimating the um, degree of aortic regurgitation. This is the diastolic flow reversal. This is the color Doppler, and this is the regurgitant um, vena contract area and the difference between the aortic diastolic blood pressure and the left ventricle and diastolic pressure multiplied by. Uh, uh, divided by the systolic blood pressure into 100. This is called the aortic regurgitation index. If it is less than 0.25 or 25%, we need to address. Similar to aortic regurgitation, the paravalvular mitral regurgitation. Uh, this is the algorithm, and you need to consider vena contractor width, vena contractor area, presence or absence of flow convergence, and uh, um, um, what is the density or the completeness of the uh, jet tracing by continuous wave Doppler? And then look into regurgitant volume, regurgitant fraction, effective regurgitant orifice area, and then decide upon mild, moderate, or severe. These are the approaches approaches to mitral paravalvular leak closure. And the coming to the two represented cases, these are the, um, I'll be, uh, presenting two cases. This is a patient who underwent um, mitral valve uh, replacement using St. Jude's valve about six months ago. He came back to the hospital after hospital discharge uh, with progressive dyspnea. For about three months duration, he was doing reasonably well for the first three months. But he had progressive dyspnea. And this is the T picture in the four chamber view showing significant paravalvular leak. This is the P2 area, which means that it is at six o'clock position. And uh, actually there were two leaks, one here at about six to seven o'clock position. And the other one at about 11 o'clock position, this was the um, true view picture. And this is the 3D color picture showing the leak at the 6 to 7 o'clock position and at the 11 o'clock position. 
this subject underwent transcatheter valve replacement. Uh, sorry, so uh, uh, closure of the paravalve loop using vascular plug. Uh, um, this uh, this the wire through the septal puncture gone through the defect and the vascular plug being deployed. And this is the picture at the end of the deployment of the vascular plug. And second vascular plug was inserted in the parallel leaf, which was at the six o'clock position. And the patient had uh, quite a good result and did well after that. The second uh, case is that of a 54 year old lady who presented with the symptoms of fatigue, cardiac failure last, for last four months. And she also gave history of uh, dark colored urine. And he, she was extremely fatigable and uh, effort, effort tolerance was extremely poor and the hemoglobin was 5.5 grams. She had undergone uh, CABG for inferior volume MI, and at that time, she also had a mitral valve alloplasty because of severe MR as a result of ischemic mitral regurgitation, ischemic MR. And this shows a para alloplasty ring MR. And uh, this subject also underwent. Uh, this is a sort of uh, not a big MR actually, but patient had severe hemolysis because of the high velocity across the um, defect para angular link. Uh, angulus. So this was again closed using vascular plugs. And this is the color of the urine before the procedure and after the procedure. You can make out the degree of hemolysis patient had before the procedure, how it got cleared when the leak was addressed. This slide shows the difficulty in imaging the posterior uh, part of the uh, structures with TTE and uh, anterior part of the structures with um, TE. And this is how the paravalent regurgitation may be uh, classified depending into mild, moderate, or severe, depending upon the perimeter of the valve and how, how what is the leak area. So if it is uh, more than 30% of the perimeter, if the leak is occurring, it is labeled as severe. And if it is less than 10%, it is labeled as mild. And you can use three dimensional uh, uh, printing for predicting size of paravalvular regurgitation and the size and uh, type of prosthetic device which can be used to close the plug can be determined by 3D printing. And with this, I would like to thank you for uh, being with us this morning. And uh, the topic is uh, now open for a discussion. Any comments, questions are most welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I kept it a bit short. Uh, um, thank you so much. I hope I was clear. And yes, sir. Uh, there are two important uh, things. One is to identify the clock position and convey it to the surgeon. Right, right. And the other one the has uh, described, and uh, according to 2014 guidelines, guidelines, patient uh, if presents with hemolytic anemia or NYHA class three or four symptoms, right. is indication for uh, transcatheter. Uh, uh, you know, device closure. So, uh, any questions are there? Uh, please ask. 
Sir, Dr. Nagraj here, sir. Yeah, tell me, Nagraj. Sir, thank you for the nice presentation, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Sir, uh, intraoperatively, if we have any paravalvular leak, I mean, do we grade them as mild, moderate, severe, or we we'll ask the surgeon to just go ahead and uh, correct the paravalvular leak? Because mild, as you showed in the second case, in which there was a mild mitral uh, regurgitation paravalvular leak, which had come after six months, but still he had come with a symptom of hemolysis. Yes, that's many of the surgeons are reluctant uh, addressing the mild, milder form of paravalvular leak, sir. So your comment, sir. Very nice uh, comment. Uh, it is really um, difficult to ask the surgeon to go back if it's a mild leak. Especially this happened in my center also. Um, a patient had been mitral replacement and there was a mild leak and uh, the there was hemolysis. And the surgeon said that, uh, don't worry if the patient is hematidinic stable, you please extubate. Patient was in the ICU and uh, it it was detected in the ICU, not in the theater. Theater, it looked okay, but uh, in the ICU on the second day when the patient was about to be extubated, it was noticed that patient had hemolysis. And when we told the surgeon and we got, uh, we did the TE and also got a second opinion and uh, this uh, was uh, confirmed that patient had uh, a leak. Uh, but the surgeon said, don't bother, if the patient is hemodynamic, just extubate, we'll put a device closure. That's what uh, sometimes happens. So if it is uh, moderate to severe, you can address it then and there. And then if it's a small leak, if you give protamine and uh, sometimes it disappear, and if it doesn't disappear, if it persists, you have to take a call in discussion with the surgeons and then um, address either then and there or um, sometime later, depending upon how it progresses. Right, sir. Okay. I hope I have so, answered the question. This is yes, what yes, actually yes. happened in my center. The surgeon said, don't bother. Sir. I don't Most know. Most of the I, surgeons I, do that, sir. Most of the surgeons do that. <laughs> it's i mean uh, we have to convince the surgeon saying that any paravalvular leak should be addressed any paravalvular leak should be addressed because I, I, in the I long run i think no, prasanna sir, prasanna sir is, uh, uh, i am here prasanna sir is here. yeah can i give a perspective of this absolutely yes, absolutely yes. yeah That's uh, what we so, said here. Yeah, Thank so, so I, I I will tell I, I have certain points and when and which I will also be touching there. So I'll can I make all the comments together so that uh, at one time. Please, please yeah. do that. Please do that. Yeah. The first thing that I would want to comment is that one of the thing, important things that uh, when we are assessing the paravalvular leak uh, is to see what is the suturing technique. Uh, right. Now, with this discussion going on on whether the surgeon should go in or not. Now, the thing is that uh, one of the things that uh, I would like to uh, always pay attention is whether it is a continuous suture or an interrupted suture technique. Most of us have shifted to interrupted, but there are patients people who are taking continuous. And if we have for any reason done a continuous suture technique, uh, right. where uh, I would strongly say that if there is even a, uh, even if there is a slight leak, you have to go because the suture that, that one third of the annulus can die. In fact, we have published where some patient had been done from some other institute, and right. uh, four uh, devices were deployed, and the patient had hemolysis, and we came and uh, I mean he was actually she was passing beetroot urine and came here in uh, severe anemia and everything, and we yeah. had to go in and uh, remove the thing, and it, so uh, that is one very important thing. So another thing that is there is uh, whether how what is the quality of decalcification that has been done. If the annulus has not been decalcified well, you may not get paravalvular leak. And, and the very important thing that I, in fact, I teach students is that you should never cross uh, the suture with calcium because even if you may not get a paravalvular leak now, because of erosion of the suture with calcium, you can have the suture cutting out in the post-operative period. That's another right, thing. Right. So, and then it depends on whether the annulus is fibrous. Usually a fibrous annulus will not give uh, usually a leak. So which were the ones which are risk where we should try to go in if you have even uh, smaller leaks or if they have got infective endocarditis. Uh, right. If you are doing surgery for endocarditis, mixomatous valves and ischemic MR, just like you showed here. 
I am a little yes, bit sir. associated with the ischemic MR and myxomatous. These three subsets because these leaks uh, tend to worsen over time. So you better do the surgery well with this. Then uh, another important thing which uh, surgical trainees, if they are there in this uh, audience, is that the gap in suture should always be less than one minute. You can have wider gap within suture, but uh, between sutures it should always be one millimeter, uh, at less one, not more than a millimeter. And another important thing is that sometimes in such cases it may be important to cross sutures so that each suture acts to prevent it cutting through. These are technical trips that are there. The other thing which I find very important is that uh, as you, uh, is to use the surface, uh, uh, sh the short axis surface view because it can help in localizing. See, the cross-sectional views are good, but uh, that requires an, a, 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 both the experienced surgeon and the resident. But if you want to make it simple for everyone, the surface uh, view gives you exactly where it is. And that's very important because many times uh, because of the way to suit the things are, you may not be able to be easily pass a probe, though theoretically you should be able to pass a probe. Sometimes you can just cannot do it because of the odd position. So if the information of where it is, that's very important. Another thing is I make it very simple. You use load independent indices. There's a in, perioperative decision should be binary, going back in or not. And yes. there's no in vacillating here and there. So I say that a post protamen, if it's more than four millimeters or if there is a flow reversal, better to go in at that time. But if, if, if it is less than that, it's uh, imparted. And uh, whenever in doubt uh, for surgical trainees, it's in doubt while doing it in the, always put a small felt strip uh, in, in case you have area which you have doubt. Because that will, even if you have a minor paravalvular leak because of fibrosis, if you use dacro, uh, use felt, Fibrosis occurs in the next few uh, this thing and it will obliterate those. The, and uh, it's always important, as you have said, that we have to assess it post protamine. And uh, as I said, I, uh, um, the issue is now you have a small lake and we, which is the one which is going to give hemolysis is the one where you have a jet which is crossing over the ring. Usually you can see a jet which if it, it, it is directed laterally, it's okay. But if it is a jet which is hitting the ring, then that is the one which is usually going to uh, create hemolysis. One of the other things is sometimes you even get hemolysis right on table itself. Yes, so that yes. is a better go in at that yes. time. So it's not that surgeons don't uh, want to go in, but then the issue is when you go in, what next is the issue? And uh, many of these patients, it's not that every patient who has immediate hemolysis will persist. We, most of the time, we do give them uh, Trental and beta blockers. In fact, I will tell them that uh, if this is happening, that uh, you can give most of them settle with the Trental beta blockers and reducing the INR. Keep the INR a little lower and dissing. But, if we, but this all works for minor leaks, which are less than uh, three or four millimeters at the most. But if it's more than that, I would definitely see TE for your uh, uh, surgery, then better you have a protocol and a plan where you're going to have a binary device. I mean, binary decision that you're going to do it or not going to uh, do it. You have to have a binary decision, no vacillation. Thank you. Thank you. All uh, valuable points you have mentioned. I'm really thankful. For, to you for joining us and giving us important insight from surgical aspects. I think all the points you mentioned are very, very valid and important and uh, we'll keep those in my mind. Dr. Sanjeevani, you want to say something? Anybody else? Dr. Sanjeevani, any comments from your side? Uh, hello, uh, good morning. Uh, it was a lovely presentation, really difficult topic, and Prasanna added vital tips, of yes, course, yes, for yes. the surgeons. And we can also, uh, you know, te teach, not teach, but suggest uh, new uh, younger surgeons. And uh, certainly it is a difficult one. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, I mean, how many. Uh, uh, how do we diagnose it? Even if it is uh, patient is not having any anemia or any uh, failure, do we address it? If we see it on a routine uh, echo postoperatively, 
My take, I will we will request our person also to answer, but my take will be if the patient is asymptomatic and he, there's no hemolysis, we just have to follow the patient um, periodically and then determine whether any in, uh, intervention is needed. If it is asymptomatic, uh, also we have to look at the cardio cardiac function. Is the regurgitation causing any disturbance in the uh, cardiovascular status with in terms of um, uh, ventricular dimensions, etc. We need to take that into consideration and then go ahead and uh, um, take an informed decision on that. Dr. Yeah. Prasad, uh, you are here. Yeah, I, I, this is a, what we also practice that if it is asymptomatic leak and a small leak which has got no hemodynamic bearing, we observe. What we generally do in those patients is that we put them on Trental beta blockers and keep the intent. If you're anticoagulating them, uh, keep the intensity of anticoagulation a little lower. Uh, but if there is a continued LV dilatation failure, uh, I mean, even if there, and there is failure of not, uh, regression of the ventricle and uh, LA continues to dilate, for example, in M uh, MR, LV volume start increasing, then you have replaced a, a MR with prosthetic uh, paravalvular MR and yes. you need to go in there. But yes. mild leaks with the, which, and if they, and another thing that you can do is you can get the LDH and uh, free hemoglobin and all those things in the urine done. Uh, if you have in, in cases where you are doubtful. Correct. I agree. I agree. But many things we have seen many cases where over a period of three to six months, those leaks disappear. So whether to go into it, that's why people be, they think whether you need to go back in or not. But my general saying is if it's more than 4 mm, it's not going to come down. So if you have got an opportunity I, on the table, it's just another short CPB run. But uh, where is it? You have to uh, be pretty sure where it is. So another uh, trick which I tell young surgeons if they are there in the thing is always tie your mitral sutures posterior and leave the and the last sutures to be tied is the anterior suture. Suppose you get a gap there, that is the area where you can see. Whereas some surgeons will tie easily see an anterior sutures and then struggle posteriorly and then have a paravalvar leak uh, posteriorly when it cuts through. So better to have a leak in an accessible area than an inaccessible area. Then the surgeon can operate by sight and not by faith when he's patching it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Another thing, uh, Dr. Prasanna really uh, told us about debulking of calcification. That is a very important point. Yes. And with uh, mitral annular calcification, Dr. Prasanna, is it going to be more difficult now? With the, see, MAC has always been there. It's not that we have not been having MAC. So you have to decalcify. The important thing, and this is something which Dr. Tendulkar had taught us always, is when you have all these cal uh, calcification are not, re though they look like that, are not contiguous. You can always decalcify, and an important thing at that stage is to take the bites between the blobs of calcium and not through the calcium. Mm -hmm. That is one thing. If you have a doubt in such, and sometimes when you are faced with a bar, you can put a collar and uh, stay higher up uh, uh, in the LA or suture the thing into the LA wall. We have done that at times. I have done it at times when I face with uh, terrible calcium and you think that it will crack the LV posteriorly in old frail uh, ladies. You just place, we then place a Dacron or a um, uh, PTFP collar all around the, uh, and, and create a virtual annulus at a higher level and implant the valve there. So it, that, requires a little bit of uh, assessment and uh, care. But, but as far as possible, keep make the annulus pliant. Another small trick is, and unfortunately that doesn't happen, is when we were having such things, it, we, we don't have the Star Edward well now, but the Mira Edward and Star Edward had a spongy annulus. And that would actually accommodate through the troughs and the uh, hills of the uh, mm -hmm. annulus. Unfortunately, we don't have that. And nowadays, with the to make the to talk, they make the uh, uh, sewing rim thinner and thinner to make the effective mm -hmm. orifice area bigger for a given valve. So that has got a higher chance when you are doing. Uh, but that is, I mean, we cannot do anything about it. But the spongy thing was a very good thing, and you would hardly see paravalvar leaks in yes. Star Edward. 
I was about to ask this: okay, how many times you have noticed uh, PV uh, leak in Star Edward, or even in the, in the very design of the spongy thing was such that it could accommodate the troughs and the hillocks which were formed by irregular calcium. That's another very important thing: why you have to smoothen the calcium and everything. Because right. that you may have tied down, but you will have a rock on one side, rock on the other side, a gap in the middle. Right, right. Very nice. Very, very can I important. ask one more question to Dr. Prasanna? Yes, 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 yes. Huh. See, uh, nowadays we get heavily calcified aortic valves. So, is it advisable to remove calcium on this aortomitral continuity side also, which is affecting mitral valve also sometimes? Yes, I do. See, for example, now we are doing a lot of Ozaki procedures and for to, to suture, you cannot be the four or five needle. You cannot go through. There's no way. You have to debride aggressively. Mm. And uh, you need to be able to debride, carefully debride. We, you can always debride along the region of the iotomitral continuity, but where you can have uh, difficulty is in the posterior LV wall. That's the time when you have to be very careful because if the calcium, uh, you can always uh, remove the calcium, delaminate the calcium and uh, excise in the aortomitral continuity. But in the posterior LV wall, uh, you are, if it is invading into the a a LV myocardium, that's mm -hmm. the place where you have to use the blob technique, which uh, I was telling you, know, remove blobs and keep, uh, because if it cracks, you will have bleeding from the transverse sinus, which, uh, I mean, it, to avoid paravervel leak, uh, you will end up with the, a potentially fatal complication with the crack and if, the, if it cracks into the posterior LV, very, very difficult uh, problem thereafter. But yes. across the iotomitral continuity, you will be able to decalcify. I have done it time and again and shown both residents and junior consultants or sometimes they call me to do it and I do it for them. It requires patience, most importantly. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm, thank you, Parimala. Uh, one, one question to Parimala. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Hello, Parimala. Good morning, nice ma'am. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, how many times you are able to convince the surgeon <laughs> to address the PV leak? I mean, what is the percentage you could convince? What is the percentage you could not? Uh, one patient, I was very particular, but that patient had infective endocarditis. Okay. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we could not convince and uh, later patient succumbed after uh, six months or so. Oh. So that oh. is one difficult case. Patient had paravalar leak. Also, uh, there was an abscess. So some patients are difficult to handle for the surgeons and for us to convince also and some patients come back for surgery and sometimes patients are not suitable for surgery redo surgery so it's a difficult topic only. and one more thing the last thing uh, um, there right. are you able to uh, are you using this 3d uh, picture whatever uh, you are we have, yeah, we have started to use it uh, in the last six months to one year. Before okay. that, we didn't have the dedicated uh, 3D machine in the OR, but we are using it now. That will be very useful, sir. Yeah, it's very useful. The the NFAS view is especially extremely useful uh, to look at the whole of the van in one go. Mm -hmm. For device deployment, 3D echo is mandatory, uh, practically. Yes, 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 yes. And for, uh, for surgeons, all surgeons want 3D echo, unfortunately. Yes, yes, yes. Cost. Yes. <laughs> but but um, nowadays they are using fusion imaging, isn't it, Dr. Murlidhar? Uh, yes, yes. That is uh, yes. your uh, cath lab uh, procedure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Fluoroscopy, angiography, and uh, uh -huh. fluoroscopy and T and uh, angiography, yeah. angiography, all those. Yeah. And I thank would you. like to thank I, you. I was surprised to see your case, Dr. Murlidhar, that uh, intraoperative yes, yes. he had so much of hemolysis and urine was that dark color. That was uh, really no, no, no. This is, this, this is not intraoperative. This is when the patient came back. Okay, After, okay, okay. Uh, six months, 
Okay, okay. She was suffering for four months, but uh, I don't know. The the lady came after four months of onset of symptoms, which included fatigability, dyspnea on exertion, and the dark colored urine. I think it progressively okay, okay. worsened, and uh, at the end of fourth month, I think she could not take it anymore. Mm -hmm. That time came. And before the procedure and after the procedure, the urine is shown, not uh, intraoperative. It's not intraoperative. Mm -hmm. okay. One small note about paravalelic in this setting is just because we have deployed a device, the, uh, it does not preclude again a leak occurring. Uh, we have had a lot of uh, cases where paravalvular leaks have been plugged. And uh, they, I don't know, we, I, we, disproportionately, we are getting cases where paravalvular leaks have been plugged in many centers around. Uh, around India and then they again continue to leak and then uh, we have been referred to uh, remove the plug, uh, plug and uh, this is so it, when you are doing the plug you have to ensure that you are 100 percent uh, this is another place where you can we have to be very careful if there is infective endocarditis never I see sincerely say uh, deploy plugs in those cases because if you have a infection of the plug again that's making matters uh, from the frying pan into the fire. Yes, yes, yes. I do agree with that. Thank you for your input. We really appreciate that. And uh, as we are coming towards the end of the session, I would like to thank Dr. Parimala, Dr. Prasanna, Dr. Sanjeevani, Dr. Nagaraj, and all the others who are present for participating. And we'll see you again tomorrow at 7 and on Sunday at 9 a.m. on the screen. Thank you so much, and uh, once again, thank you for joining thank us. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Thank you.